Hi everyone, I, um, I just want to make a couple of quick comments. I just feel like talking, I'm sick of writing. <laughs> um, uh, and Ryan Theodore um, asked me a really nice little question um, in response to an article that I wrote about the circularity of morals, uh, the nature of moral reasoning um, being the thing that we base all our decisions on. Um, where uh, I was trying to make the point that what morals are uh, effectively um, the way things are done. They are the essential bedrock of our belief systems. Uh, and we get into a particular irony when we try to avoid morality as if it was somehow better <laughs> to be amoral, as if there was some advantage or some uh, necessary superiority in a position where morality is avoided. And of course, that is actually moralization. Uh, I like to kind of point out the irony that nihilism, in a way, uh, this attempt that some of us make to be creatures of pure logic and, and people who somehow are separate from the burden of belief that operate in some sort of true evidential fashion. Actually, that's moralism. Uh, that's a beautiful example of value judgment, that logic, uh, that that exact sort of separation from emotional uh, response and from um, clouding by various um, irrelevant aspects. Uh, the proposal that that state of mind is to be praised, to be valued, to be preferred is actually moralism. It, it's, it's a value judgment in itself. So I, I love to kind of point out that irony is where it's better to avoid moralizing. Um, anyway, Ryan asked in response to that, uh, to for me to make a comment on empathy as an evolutionary advantage. This idea that uh, really the selfish gene, as Richard Dawkins might uh, might say, is what drives uh, evolution itself. This real desire to survive. And he's very careful in his book that I have read bits of. I, might, I don't think I read the whole thing. I often get sick of stuff when I, I feel like it's reached a certain point. Uh, but he is very careful to point out that there is no inherent mindfulness in molecular biology that what you're seeing as an apparent uh, evolution according to a desire to survive is really the result of selection pressures that have nothing to do with any type of, of desire or any type of drive. Uh, Daniel Dennett is another philosopher that takes on this question of whether or not there is an inherent mindfulness in the operations of biology. He wrote a book called Kinds of Minds where he takes what he calls the intentional stance. And I would encourage anyone kind of interested in the question of um, panpsychism, the question of how consciousness relates to uh, the material universe and how consciousness may have developed or, or whether it has always been present in some sense. Um, I'd encourage anyone interested in those topics to, to look at uh, kinds of minds. Uh, because I personally think that the intentional stance whereby we effectively reverse engineer uh, what we have now in terms of causative explanation of how that could have come from uh, parts that are without the properties. This, this idea that gets bundled together as um, uh, this complex um, sort of systems theory and um, emergence as, as a catch-all term for a scenario or a, a state of affairs that occurs as a result of the summation of other subsets which do not have the properties which the summation itself has. So this gain of function which subtypes, take cells for example, do not have but that their accumulation as a complex dynamic network uh, do, does have. And there is some real merit to that argument but of course it, it actually relies on there being this emerged system observing emergence. Uh, so it, it, it's post hoc. It, it is the creation of reasoning by a, a, an entity uh, capable of reasoning 
to explain that reasoning, being present, the, the origins of logic, the evolution of logic must be constructed from a standpoint where that logic is already in operation and fully so able to criticize and to analyze its own occurrence from a time when it was not. There's an inherent error in doing that. There is a tautology which necessarily occurs, which also denies itself. And that's the intentional stance. That's saying, we now know how we are and who we are because of what we came from, which did not know how it was or who it was. There isn't a continuity there. There's, a, there's an inherent discontinuity, just like there is with abiogenesis. Uh, what we actually end up concluding is that consciousness and self-awareness and non-consciousness and non-self-awareness must be the same thing. Because we have a Sorites paradox at which there is a point of transition from non-consciousness and non-awareness to consciousness and awareness, such that that consciousness and awareness is able to look back and say, hey, at some point, I came from something which was not me. And that's a reasonable thing to say in one sense, but only from the position where one is always already the thing <laughs> that can speak and can analyze. And what one is saying is that my argument, my development, my evolution to this point is something which did not have the properties which I now have. And I know this because I now have them. There is a discontinuity in the argument. There must be. Because the premise is actually completely separate from the conclusion. We are literally putting the horse before the cart. Because we are using logic to explain a point at which logic did not exist in the way that we are now using it analytically to explain that. That actually reduces to absurdity. And this is what I wanted to bring up about the nature of evolution and empathy as an evolutionary outcome, as something that was preferred, something that was selected for. I want to quote a, a very famous uh, section of Albert Camus' writing from An Absurd Reasoning. He writes, famously, There is but one truly serious philosophical problem. And that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, <laughs> a lovely reference to Aristotle, comes afterwards. These are games. One must first answer. Beautiful. So, uh, Harking to sort of the ideas of uh, Sisyphus's re revolt, uh, the myth of Sisyphus, the problem that we have is why empathy? Uh, okay, let's let's take an intentional stance that if you are empathic and you your selfish genes have uh, evolved to a state where their operations protect the continuance of their reproduction, that makes sense. Uh, there are a lot of good examples in biology uh, that point to that probability, that where there are defensive mechanisms, where there are self-perpetuating, self-protecting mechanisms, that self persists. Uh, that's obvious in a sense. What's not obvious in any way, shape or form is why that would be better than not existing. Uh, when we try to make an argument that says, look, empathy and this uh, kin relationship, this psychology of uh, selfness, uh, whereby um, young and other um, kin members are prioritised such that selfish genes look after their own. Um, why would that be preferable to life not existing? Well, from the standpoint of a universe uh, that has no interest, that has no empathy itself, that has no reason for reason, for logic to evolve in a sense that is self-conscious, 
there for a universe that is separate from that impartial non-thinking non-living non-empathic to select a scenario uh, where self perpetuating mechanisms are preferred makes no sense there is no reason for that there is no valid argument for that because there is no validity there's no sense in which one argument is better than another there's no way in which we can justify selfish genes being selfish because elements and subatomic particles as Dawkins rightly points out have no preferences uh, but there's a deeper point here there is no reason in a world and a universe without an empathic logic being present a priori for life to ever want to sustain itself in any way and, and definitely not to become conscious of that. There is no argument that makes any sense for me to want to avoid death because in a universe that comes from an illogical, uh, so a, 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 a scenario whereby the universe has no desire <laughs> to be consistent and no cause to be consistent. Uh, we can think about physical laws as consistencies in themselves, but again, we fall into the hard problem of consciousness whereby there is Again, no argument, no justification for any part of that universe becoming aware of consistency and preferring it. Because we could have consistent laws, but those do not give rise necessarily in any logical sense to beings which prefer consistency. No, no, no we might as well be dead because deadness in a world where life is something which is not necessarily preferable that occurred according to probabilities which could be the other way and it would not matter in that scenario there is no reason there is no justification there is no argument there is no logic for there being a gene that is selfish. Why would it happen? Just because it has does not create a reason for that. We can't say because we desire not to die and we experience this both in our own sense of mortality but also our empathy that we project. The reason for that is because it was better for life to do that and that is why we came out to be this way. Because there isn't a reason for life to do that where we have a universe that does not care for life there's no there's no valid argument because validity itself isn't a thing that's again a projection post hoc of an intelligent creature with empathy wondering why it is the way it is and creating a causal chain from observations. That is not evidence for anything except the pre-existent moral entity. Now that could be us. It is in, irrefutable to... Uh, you, you cannot refute a solipsistic argument that says what makes the argument for a, an intelligent empathic being is the intelligent empathic being projecting itself onto its perceptions. Okay, fine. Brain in a vat, first year philosophy, out of the way. Uh, because in that scenario, you are entirely alone. There is no one but you. Everything you see is you, and I am you, and all of this is completely circular in a way that makes nothing uh, learnable. You know everything already. Uh, we have sort of uh, Fitcher's paradox of knowability come into play as everything becomes logically knowable from first principles because you are the first principles. That's all there is. 
Okay, that's a pretty useless argument and uh, it falls apart when the question of other minds and whether uh, there is anything new at all that we can possibly experience or use science to investigate. It, it, it makes everything completely useless, right? Okay, so I think we can leave that to one side, just like we can leave the simulation argument to one side because it makes no difference. Um, but with respect to questions of theology and and how we can reason about um, a universe emerging um, and a, a conscious entity and other um, beings in a material universe apparently desiring to survive by our analysis of their behavior. The, the way that we think about that emerging actually does necessitate empathy existing a priori in order for life to be prioritized. And that is why we might see genes behaving in a selfish fashion. Why we might see a, an increasingly complex and increasingly interactive set of circumstances, which we then call life, being prioritized over Random, well, I uh, don't want to say, r randomness to me means a set of, uh, of occurrences which cannot be correlated in any meaningful fashion. Uh, it does not mean that they are not caused. It means that their causality is unknown, uh, that, they're, that they're undecidable. But again, you know, for a logically structured system of self-perpetuating, self-awareness to come about emergently, it, it requires for the argument to have any validity, validity to be present a priori, and for that validity to be, to be justified by empathy, <laughs> by this sense, this moral sense that life is better than non-life. Because if that is not the case, then the argument for evolutionary empathy falls to pieces. It is unjustifiable because there is no reason, there is no justification, there is no foundation from which the assumption can be made that life as it exists ought to be. There, for, for life to perpetuate itself, there must be a logical reason for that to occur, which may well be later expressed as empathy in a very... Uh, complex and self-aware organism. Me. I keep pointing at me because, of course, we're talking about humans mostly here. But for that to be the case, you cannot have the outcome as the justification. That's a fallacy, necessarily so. It's tautologous reasoning. Um, we cannot use the intentional stance of this is where we are, which means this is what must have happened to get us here, but the reason it happened is because that's the way it was. That's not an argument, that's not a justification, that's not a reasoning, and of course, if that is actually the case, then nonsense is at least as good as sense. There, there isn't any reason for us to prefer life. There isn't any reason for empathy to exist because it wasn't there to start with. So why would it be here now? Well, it is, we give those reasons because it is here now. And of course that's invalid. So I, I just wanted to try and nut that out, try and show how really Kamu's point holds very, very, very deeply when we go to try and give explanations to create causal chains for what we now see and project those onto the smaller, uh, you know, sort of molecular level biological observations that we can make in order to piece them together into us. Uh, there are some inherent problems with doing that. And I find that unfortunately, it, I have a, a, a molecular biology degree as a, as a bachelor, uh, and followed by a medical degree. So, so you're forced to grapple with some of this as you study that sort of information at that level. But I find that even amongst people who do have some good scientific training, uh, some, some of us haven't grappled with the implications of uh, projecting properties 
which we take for granted literally now because we are using them in our creation of argumentation. Um, taking, some of us don't consider the problems inherent and especially the logical contradictions involved in taking that and pushing it onto a scenario which we then deny having the properties which we are using it to explain. Again, the point is discontinuity. A, a Sorites paradox evolves, literally, whereby in emergence we see properties emerge that then must be removed from the precedent by the observing outcome applying that logic. It doesn't work. It can't. It is exactly like a calculator saying what has resulted as my calculation comes from a universe where calculation isn't present. The calculation occurs from a non-calculating state. Sure, but that's an invalid argument. It can't be made because it can't come from anywhere. And that's our problem of empathy, is if it's an emergent property, just like life, really, there isn't a distinctive difference between what it comes from and what it is now. That difference is being proposed by what already is in existence. It's self-denial, self-contradiction, and thereby reduces to absurdity, which is why Kamu can ask, should we live or not? Because in a universe where life happens because, 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 where life is a logical evolution according to natural consistencies. Remember, we started with this idea that perhaps there are just consistencies which prefer consistencies because they're consistencies. Okay, that makes a tiny bit of sense. But it does not, again, getting to the, uh, the hard problem of consciousness, that has no explanatory power whatsoever. There is no sense in which that line of reasoning produces preferential valuation. That line of reasoning only produces same begets same. And in a universe where life was not, same begets same, and it never will be.